Well, hello there and welcome to the Trending Now podcast for a Friday, September the 1st, 2023. We have made it to September and although it is Labor Day weekend this weekend, I think it's time we officially say goodbye to summer 2023. Thank you for everything you brought us summer 2023. And yeah, we get one more weekend. Maybe you're lucky enough to have the long weekend like half the people in this building do. Maybe you have to be here on Monday like the other half of the people in this building do. But uh, regardless, enjoy this uh, last few days of summer. Uh, And thanks for making the Trending Now podcast a part of your weekend. We appreciate it. Make sure you like and subscribe so you never miss an episode of this show. Or maybe any other shows that we may put out in the near future. Just just kind of hinting, just saying, maybe just subscribe, like, so you never miss an episode. Of course, Trending Now is every Monday to Friday, 7 p.m. on CHCH and at chch.com and streaming live on the Trending Now YouTube page. And if you miss it at 7, you can catch it again at 11.30 following the CHCH evening news at 11. Lots to get to. And the week that was on trending now, including more green belt drama. Yeah, that's not going away anytime soon. Uh, some sports news we'll get into, including some big news in the world of Canadian soccer. Uh, Hurricane Idalia touches down in Florida this week as well. And uh, uh, global affairs of Canada with some interesting recommendations uh, when it comes to adv- ad- advisements. Uh, when it comes to heading south of the border. And we'll get to all that coming up uh, in just a little bit. But first, uh, we're going to get with some sad news in the U.S. Uh, Another somber day in the U.S., this time in Jacksonville, Florida, grieving the loss of three innocent people gunned down because of the color of their skin. Police say the murderer knew exactly what he was doing when he opened fire at a dollar store in Jacksonville, Florida, on Saturday He had authored several manifestos for his parents, the media, and law enforcement detailing his hatred for black people. Investigators also say before the gunman arrived at the Dollar General, he showed up in the parking lot of an historically black university nearby, but was turned away by security for refusing to identify himself. Now, after going to that dollar store and killing three people, the murderer, Ryan Christopher Palmiter, texted his father and then killed himself. The shooting occurred as the Jacksonville community prepared for what is an annual commemoration of what is known as Axe Handle Saturday. It was an unforgettable exhibition of brutality 63 years ago. Uh, when a mob of white people used baseball bats and axe handles to club peaceful black demonstrators protest testing segregation at a downtown lunch counter in August 1960. Now, sitting with civil rights leaders, U.S. President Joe Biden addressed the racist act in Jacksonville this week. We can't let hate prevail, and it's on the rise. It's not, not diminishing. Silence, I believe, we've all said many times, silence is complicity. We're not going to remain silent. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis also spoke out against the violence, but he was heckled while speaking at a vigil for the victims. Now, police say the killer was briefly held under state law called the Baker Act in 2017, which states a person can be taken to a receiving facility for involuntarily involuntary examination during a mental health crisis. Yet his guns were legally purchased. Also trending Monday, huge news in the world of Canadian soccer is John Herdman quit as coach of Canada's men's national team to instead coach Toronto FC of MLS. The 48-year-old native of England will assume coaching responsibilities as of October 1st from interim head coach Terry Dunfield, who took over the role following the dismissal of Bob Bradley in June. Now, Herdman comes to the MLS after 13 successful years coaching Canada at the international level. He took over the Canadian men's coach in 2018 after seven years leading Canadian women, helping them qualify for a World Cup since the first time since 1986, that being the men. And for more on this and many other sports topics of the week, it was a busy week in sports. Luckily, we have Jason Guidola filling in on Trending Now as the reporter. Uh, Jason, always great to see you. Thanks for doing this, buddy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, um, let's talk about the Herdman stuff first. Um, 
maybe a bit surprising. World Cup coming to Canada. Has he gotten everything he can out of that uh, out of that job? What do you make of this one? I think he got. I think he got everything that he could out of that job, considering the 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 temperature and the the what's happening within uh, Canada soccer right now. It's just, it just doesn't look like a tenable jo- like a, a good job to take right yeah. now, considering that you know if they're axing friendlies and they're not they're not having enough money to you know settle their labor disputes, and on top and on top of that, he was he was getting some flack and maybe they I'm, I'm hearing reports that there was um, you know there was some. Uh, Disagree, the yeah, unhappiness in the uh, within the team and on certain, uh, you know, and that that happens a lot. And it just look, it's I think it's pretty obvious. And he probably just thought to himself, "Is this worth it anymore?" I mean, 2026 is still three years away. It's a long time, and he's got to go through the grind uh, for th- that long, and, and he's going to wait that long. And is it worth it? I don't know. I think he already made his mark with the national team already uh you know historically making qatar and mm. and being at the world cup because maybe to him it's just like well i've i've been to the world cup yeah <laughs> it would have been special obviously to be the host nation you know coaching them as the host nation but maybe i just see i just think it, it doesn't seem like it's worth it anymore plus i'm sure money was a factor i mean mls has got some money they're they deep, got they're deep pocketed aren't they many many monies many many monies indeed mls has uh, i've met john herdman a couple times i've covered the canadian men's national team one of my favorite memories involving uh john herdman happened at bmo field uh canada was taken on us i was working the camera crew for one soccer at the time and mm-hmm. i was basically just a handheld shooting behind the scenes stuff and uh, we were in the the tunnel and uh, you know everybody else is getting out they're doing the jumping thing John Herdman was the last one to go out the tunnel he looked at me gave me a little fist bump and he walked out onto the field and I was like the last little fist bump that he gave before he walked on the field Canada beat the U.S. 2-0 that game huge I think it was the first time they had beaten the U.S. in like 30 years or something like that um, but it was kind of cool to get that little fist bump from John Herdman he's not he's not a tall guy like he's like no. he's like five six man he's a small petite little dude he's awesome though a uh, great great coach and I'm really excited to see what he can do with TFC who has been absolute dog sh- stuff uh, the last few years I just want to say that's a great story. That kind of reminds me of like a Mean Joe Green, like down the hall. Uh, yeah. That was a yeah, Pep, uh, yeah, Coca-Cola exactly. commercial. Like. Yeah, it was exactly just like he looked at me with like a little camera, my little bib on. And he's just like gave me a fist bump. And then they won. I'm like, I'm never washing this hand again. Like John Herdman <laughs> fist bumped me. And then I saw, I saw him a couple of weeks later in Florida because I was covering Canada, U.S. in Florida. And I told them, I was like, well, you know, you got to fist bump me before you go out on the pitch. They ended up losing that game 3 nothing. So that that was the end of the good luck fist bump from Louis B. It, it's a great story to, uh, to tell and always tell it. But, yeah, him <laughs> going to TFC, it's just, I don't know. I mean, I, it's a coaching change always, re, like, re, rejuvenates a team, yeah. right? And, I, I mean, they won the last game. They, <laughs> they look did. like a completely different team. I don't know if it's yeah. because they just want to move on with the old regime. I mean, that's all it takes is a little bit of a manager or coaching change, and the team is motivated again. And he's a huge motivator. I mean, he, he just – I think he does what he does. He's more of a, you know, maybe – I'm not saying he's not tactical, but I yeah. think he focuses on, like, team chemistry and team unity and just, uh, you know, building a very high chemistry team. And maybe that that's probably that's what's missing uh, probably with TFC right now is that they're just not there. There seems to be a disconnection there. And maybe he's going to help bring that connection. Speaking of disconnection, um, whatever happened to Canadians dominating the tennis world? U.S. Open this week. Canadians made a very quick exit out of the U.S. Open. All of them gone by, I believe, round two, round three. We're in round three this weekend. Um, something happened. We're, we're all the good Canadian tennis players. It's just it. it Again, it's like a, it's like a Greek tragedy. It's just <laughs> it, was, it was brutal to see. I I don't know what's I don't know what's happening. I just think that you know you know Raonic was at the top of the yeah. of the of, he was almost the face of it at the beginning of it. Yeah. You know, then Jeannie Bouchard came in, then and then she fizzled out, yeah. and then uh, uh, Andrescu comes in, huge star. You know, like U.S. And, Open and winner. She won the whole damn thing. The whole thing, and then it just went away. And I, I mean, like I'm, I'm seeing a trend here. I, I just, I, I don't know what's happening. Maybe the, uh, m- maybe other tennis players are catching yeah. up and they're yeah. just uh, maybe they, they're catching up to their games and they haven't quite evolved yet. And uh, I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, most. There's only a handful of tennis players that are that sustain greatness for yeah. such a long time. We've been uh, spoiled too. We've been spoiled, yeah. We've really it, been spoiled. Where are you in the no, the Djokovic 
Federer, Nadal. Are you? Because I was someone who was always like, Federer yeah. is my guy. Like Roger Federer, rough. Like Roger Federer is is my guy. And then Nadal was like, oh, this guy's, oh, he's going to win all the French Opens. And now Djokovic has come in. He's passed both of them. Like, is Djokovic the GOAT in your mind? Like, if you're taking yeah, I, a step back of the last 20 it, years, this kind of. It's it's hard to argue against if, yeah. if somebody were were to say, you know what, I, I'd rather take Djokovic over yeah. uh, Roger Federer. Would you? Would you? I'm not, I, that's a tough one. I, I don't know. Um I mean, I, I'm, a, I, I'm still a Federer guy. I still think Federer, like, I think he started this whole, you know, the, this great three. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm Roger Federer will always have kind of a match for your here. life. Joke of it. And at their peaks. There were a lot of great Wimbledons, Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal. And then Djokovic kind of came in as the younger, a younger right. one by a few years. I but. think I think Nadal, I mean, there, there might be the reputation. No, no, sorry. What I'm going to say, I, <laughs> yeah. think, I think Nadal might have the reputation because he's the king of clay. Maybe clay was just kind of like his, it, maybe it might be a little heavier on the success on just yeah, clay oh. while the others... Yeah. Or More well-rounded. Every, well-rounded. I I don't know. I'm not saying no. I'm sure. Yeah. Like I, no, I'd have no, to look no. it up. But I'm sure yeah. Nadal's won lots outside of clay. But maybe that's just kind of the the narrative around Nadal. Um, but I mean, I don't know. There was. I I, I will say there was a time where. Jo- I mean, maybe joke was Djokovic the better athlete. I don't know. I, yeah. Does it come down to athletics, uh, athletic ability? I don't, I, don't I, just, know. Love, so I just love people people putting people in a box and being I like, prob- pick what? You know what? Pick what? Um, uh, in game of match of your life, yeah, both of them at their peaks, I probably would take Djokovic. There you go. Okay, see, that, then now we have the answer. Uh, big weekend, uh, Labor Day Classic. Yep. Our our Hamilton Tiger Cats, the team that. Uh, <sighs> I don't know, man. I'm a little nervous. Not gonna lie. Well, I mean, against the Argos, Tim Hortons Field, a thirty sh- kickoff, a shocking win against BC. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my, are the Tiger Cats humming again? <laughs> they appear to be. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm gonna reserve excitement. I mean, it was a, gr- it was a shocking win. It was a great win yeah. out in Vancouver. Um, I, I'm gonna need to see a little bit more. Yeah. I don't know. Like it. It was a dominant win, thirty to fourteen. They were ten was. and a half point underdogs. I'm going into the game on last week you and i were talking a week ago today yep and i said you know i can't remember that i've seen the tie cats 10 and a half point underdogs and what do they do they win by 16 points i think the team the makeup of the team and if given if powell's still a quarterback is that this is a team that's the defense is going to have to keep the games as, as low scoring as possible they're going to have to stop points from getting uh, getting on the board and you know, we're, we're going to have to have some semblance of a, of, of a running game, and Powell's just going to have to not turn over the ball. Very, like, ground and pound and, and defense, low-scoring games, and as long as the Cats can keep that, I think they give them – they you never know. They could have a turnaround. Yeah. I just can't I just can't see them getting into a shootout and beating a team uh, then. So yeah, does that mean, like, they're going to make well, a run of the playoffs? I, I don't know. Shad Kelly was trending this week because he became the highest paid player in the CFL, signing a three-year contract extension worth just over $1.8 million. Um, are you one of those people who buys in that that he is the the next face of the CFL, that he needs to do well for the CFL to do well? He could be. Uh, he uh, just the simple. I mean, he's he's got a lot of ability. Um, it's, you know, he was kind of that that – he was a fairly highly touted absolute college player yeah, absolutely. Um, without a it question just didn't work out in the nfl and it might have been a very uh, quick and aggressive move by mlsc to give him that contract extension because i mean the argos are seeing better days uh, with people in the stands now there's yeah. more people in the stands they're 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 getting momentum and it's like well let's let's make a splash you know extension signing here you know let's be serious about keeping him uh, keeping him on the roster yeah uh, because you know will he go back will he have another shot at the nfl he could but as as long as the argonauts know say hey we want to be we, we want to show some commitment mlsc wants to show commitment to their team yeah i think that's that is where uh you could that could also play into him being a potential face of the league but uh i don't know i think there's there's a he's i don't think he's the only one but yeah. I, you know being a toronto argonaut quarterback I don't know. I, I it, maybe in my own world, it, it feels like there is some. It's like I I equate it to like you know center fielder for the Yankees or yeah uh, yeah yeah or uh, you know quarterback for the the Dallas Cowboys because you know, the Argonauts are you know, yeah as 
they have a deep history, right? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. It should be fun. It should make Monday a great game. I know you're very busy. What are you working on today? Oh, it's going to be uh, what it, we're going to actually de- <laughs> I'm delving into what is actual Marxism. OK. After there, uh, there was another video again, Pierre Polyev going viral again. He was calling uh, Justin Trudeau and his father, Pierre, uh, Marxist. Marxist. And it's a pretty that's a pretty uh, big, uh, uh, you know, shot being thrown at the uh, prime minister's way and uh you know whether and i mean it's political sparring right yeah. and it's it's showing that i'm working on the fact that i'm just looking at the history of these two men just don't actually and yeah. as experts are telling me they just these are two men that just don't like each other yeah. and it's it's going to get ugly it's uh you know not for uh, it's n- not a good thing obviously yeah. no. because you know we it it's i think it's an unfortunate to be in a very politically charged uh, uh, you know, at t- point of time, mm. you know, mm. for anybody, you know, whether you're in Canada, United States, or whatever. Yeah. But uh, it's that's what I'm going to be working on. And, uh, you know, the term gets thrown around a lot, but I, I'm like, do people actually know what it means? You'll find out. All right, we will find out. Jason Gaidola, thanks so much for doing this. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lou. All right, Jason Gaidola, uh, but he's the reporter this week on Trending Now. Now, also trending this week, Hurricane Idalia making landfall in Florida. The storm plowed through the Big Bend region of the Sunshine State, where millions of residents had either evacuated or hunkered down in anticipation of a dangerous storm surge of tidal water. Now, drawing on strength from the Gulf of Mexico's warm waters, Idalia unleashed destructive winds and torrential downpours, flooding streets from Tampa to Tallahassee. Overnight Tuesday, Adalia attained a an extremely dangerous Category 4 intensity with maximum sustained winds of over 200 kilometers an hour. By late morning, though, wind speeds had dropped, reducing the storm to a Category 1 as it entered Georgia. More than 400,000 homes and businesses in both states were without power at some point, and U.S. airlines were forced to cancel over 1,000 flights as a result of the storm. Florida Highway Patrol say two drivers died in separate rain-related crashes, while over 75 people needed to be rescued from floodwaters in St. Petersburg alone. U.S. President Joe Biden speaking after the initial aftermath of the storm, calling it another example of the climate crisis. I don't think anybody can deny the impact of the climate crisis anymore. Just look around. Historic floods. I mean, historic floods. More intense droughts. Extreme heat. Significant wildfires have caused significant damage like we've never seen before, not only throughout the Hawaiian Islands in the United States, but in Canada and other parts of the world. Biden also saying that he talked to governors from the states where Hurricane Adalia was expected to have the most impact and was ready to mobilize any federal resources needed by them. Adalia is the fourth major hurricane to strike Florida in the past seven years following Irma in 2017, Michael in 2018, and Ian, which peaked at Category 5 last September. Sticking with the uh, U.S. in trending news this week, U.S. laws centered around drag shows and gender care have prompted Canadian officials to advise their own citizens to proceed with caution when visiting south of the border. This week, Global Affairs Canada updated its international travel advisories, warning members of the LGBTQ plus community that they may face discrimination in some parts of the U.S. This follows a warning from U.S. Homeland Security that threats of violence against the queer community were becoming more frequent and intense. Global Affairs Canada updated its international caution by saying, quote, since the beginning of 2023, certain states in the U.S. have passed laws banning drag shows and restricting the transgender community from access to gender affirming care and from participation in sporting events. Now, experts on the home front believe that the travel caution is justified as the move comes after at least 18 U.S. states pass laws that limit or ban certain things, including gender-related care for minors and sexual orientation in schools. And that was felt right here at home that we're going to get to in just a second. But before that, we're going to bring into the conversation trending now producer Laura Sebin. And I mean, Laura, this really shouldn't come as a surprise 
based on what's going on in the States, you were on the show a couple of months ago talking about how certain activist groups in the U.S. were also warning about going to Florida or other states like that. I mean, scary stuff that these advisories have to be put out in the first place. Yeah, I think it's crazy that this is happening in 2023. Like, it's truly alarming how backwards some of the things in North America are going right now. And like, these people aren't doing anything wrong. They're just trying to live their lives as their authentic selves. And I don't know, the U.S. seems to have a problem with it. And I just really hope that should um, we have an election in the future federally and things change hands that the conservative party here doesn't try to do the same thing. Um I mean, to your point about it, it's scary seeing what's happening in the States. I mean, this is also happening right here at home. A little, yeah, a little right? bit. This is, I mean, mm. not maybe not to the, the laws that are being put in place, but you and I have both seen stories in our own backyard about drag breakfasts mm -hmm. that are being protested um, because it's the critics, people are saying it's yeah you're you're targeting children i i just a, like a none, child's gonna be gay like, uh, like if your kid's gonna exactly. be gay it's drag gonna queen be gay. or not drag whether it's drag queen or not <laughs> like that's i think that's there's this idea that this is turning kids yeah and it's and it's interesting because like you know kids are in a constant state of like learning yeah and if you choose to be one of those parents who like wants to show their children like queer culture and be like, Hey, this is like things that happen around. Like, don't know if you're going to want to be a part of this or whatever, but like, this is something that like, these are certain groups of people just like anybody else. Right. Mm -hmm. If you choose to be like one of those parents, like you can describe drag queens and queer people like literally any way you want and same thing for people who might not want their children to know about that if you walk past a drag show one day with your kid and your kid looks at you and goes what's that you can explain to them what that is any way you want so you can not tell your kid anything about drag yeah. queens if you don't want and there's no way that they're gonna know especially if they're like under the age of 12 like they don't know what the internet is like they like, but yeah. i mean that's the other thing that's the other thing here is that parents do not know 90 percent of what their kids are doing on the internet it's like I, I'm, I like as somebody who grew up with the internet and who grew up with with you know parents but yeah. like, i know how to finish that but like they don't know it, it, at least 90 oh yeah of like my parents were so anti-internet like they were like nope nope yeah we didn't get a computer in my house until i was in grade seven wow. um and i was only allowed to use it for homework yeah or these like do you remember like jumpstart for kids and stuff yeah, yeah. my mom bought like those and, like <laughs> you were allowed to play those yeah so like in grade eight when i wanted to get facebook i had to like sign up under a fake name wow. i had to be like quick with the tab switches when my yeah. mom came upstairs like there's ways to get around it and like your kid is gonna search for whatever they want to search for but like assuming that like a drag queen performing or or anything like any queer person existing is trying to like sexualize your child is like insane behavior in uh, my opinion so pushback is continuing in u.s classrooms mm -hmm. regarding parental rights but also right here at home pronouns in schools are trending yeah. uh, as ontario's education minister stephen lecce faced backlash this week after saying parents must quote be fully involved if their child chooses to use a different name or gender pronoun at school. Now, the new education policy in Ontario follows similar ones in Saskatchewan and New Brunswick that require parental consent when children want to change their name or pronouns at school. Lecce did note that schools should be safe for all children and that teachers and school boards take home environments into account where there are exceptional circumstances or situations of potential harm to the child. Meanwhile, opponents to the policy say they will cause some students to go back in the closet or could also embolden people to express more homophobic and transphobic views. I think that's that last line there, I think, is the one that is that people think it's OK to mm -hmm. to be a homophobe or a transphobe mm -hmm. because, well, the law is on their side here. A hundred percent. And I think um, one of the really like being 
even though it is 2023, being any kind of gay as like a child is like still kind of scary. You don't know 100% if your parents are on board. You don't know if your family members are on board. You don't even know like sometimes if like your teachers are on board. So some kids actually feel like school is a safer space to express themselves than they do at home. And like if your kid decides they want to go by he him pronouns instead of she her at school while i understand from a parent's perspective you would like to know that it's not like life ruining if they choose to say like i don't want to be this person in front of my parents yet <laughs> hopefully they'll become more comfortable to do that yeah. but my problem with what he said what leche said was he said something about like you know like it's it's a medical issue like a health issue and like changing your pronouns is not a medical or a health issue like trying to make it seem like it's like some sort of like mental health thing or that like anyone who wants to change their pronouns like wants to undergo s gender affirming surgery yeah. is like really dangerous and and that is what like that can emblazon all, people but like that is what's getting like, what this policy yeah, this policy here is okay yeah you know he's saying exceptional circumstances you know situations of potential harm to the child again like uh, you but know, I can, requires... under, I, can under, I can understand why 100%. people are are for this. But 100%. I, I also think, like, mm, but the you can't put it all under one. Yeah, the teacher can't, in those circumstances, the teacher can't go to the parents first. Hmm. The teacher has to go yeah. to the kid first. And oh, be like, yeah. Hey. oh, yeah, and that's kind of the duty to report. Yeah. If the kid comes and says, you, that's, you need to. You got to talk to the kid first and be like, I've... are you you know what's up are you yeah. cool with this at home do you go by these pronouns at home do you go by this name at home especially and if LGBT, you don't yeah. yeah and if you don't why not like are you scared like you shouldn't be like oh this person wants to use different pronouns let me tell their parents right away because because you don't well it's it's just the things uh, like you, the things you see like suicide rates mm -hmm. among lgbtq mm -hmm. youth and the suicide rates of of those individuals versus mm -hmm. the general population mm -hmm. Like, it's because of things like this. Yeah. It's because they don't have a safe place at home. They don't feel comfortable at mm -hmm. home. And I, I don't know. This is... And I, I know that they have got bigger issues to fry because we got the green... Not even bigger issues, but the green belt, like... They, I, <laughs> it just... It's like... I don't know. I... I think it'll be I think this policy or this like idea will be worse in Catholic schools. Like, I don't know if you went to a Catholic school, but I did and... I graduated in 2013, so about 10 years ago, which is jarring to say. <laughs> um, but there were assignments when I was in grade 12 that were homophobic, like yeah. through and through. Like one of the essays I had to write was to prove why, according to the catechism in the Bible, being gay is morally wrong. I had to literally write an essay about that in 2013 in Catholic high school. Mm -hmm. So even schools aren't really that safe right now for LGBTQ students well and, we've seen those know. those uh, groups too they've uh, you know ri r raising the pride flag <laughs> is That's becomes like the a thing. thing putting a flag I like know. putting a flag to show that students that they are welcome here mm -hmm. is triggering to people and the other thing is like who cares it doesn't affect Let them live you. their lives like who cares i know especially I know. yeah especially the people who are protesting to save the children who don't have any children and also the children no, anyway um <laughs> thanks for doing this big plans for the weekend do i have big plans for the weekend? It's labor oh, weekend. Do, I, well we don't get a long weekend I'm going i do to, oh do you yeah. well that's I'm well so i'm working next you. saturday so i'm working next saturday at supercross so i made a deal okay well whatever I'm labor day this is my i got like this is my first long weekend since i've started working here so that's i love 14 that for months. you so it's like friday to monday I'm probably only going to check my emails like twice, even though I have no reason to check them. Just force of habit will make me check my emails. Well, yeah. Well, I'm going to a winery Saturday and then hanging out with some old friends Sunday. And what are your exciting... How old are your friends? Like, not old friends. Uh, like, yeah. uh, well, what are you I'm, doing with I'm, your first I'm heading, long weekend? I'm heading up to Guelph. Uh, heading up Brothers Brewery. Shout out to my boys, Brothers Brewery okay. uh, in Guelph. Uh, nice. they, they, own the, they own the joint. Um, and I haven't been up there all summer. I got a lot of friends up there that I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, it's my dad's birthday Love. on Sunday. Uh, shout out Jimmer. Nice. It's his birthday. <laughs> uh, he turned uh, a little bit older than me. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. And then uh, Monday, Labor Day Classic, going to the Thai Cat. Oh, that'll be so great. That'll be so great. And plus, it's supposed to be beautiful weather. Oh, I know. 
about time. About time. About time. Uh, Laura Sabin, thanks so much for doing this. Always appreciate your insights on this. Thanks, Louie. All right, that's Laura Sabin uh, talking about uh, everything that's going on uh, when it comes to pronouns in schools in Ontario as uh, Stephen Lecce trending this week. And sticking with the Ontario government, the green belt. Yeah, it's still a thing. Despite what people may say, the green belt is still a thing. And mistakes were made. Big mistakes. And now Premier Doug Ford is mad. Guess what? You're done. You're gone. Test me out. Try me again. That's the reaction many were expecting to have of the Premier. That he'd have towards his housing minister. But that was actually the message to developers his government sold green belt land to. Now, a harsh message from the Premier for developers. Because I'm fed up with it. Absolutely fed up with playing little games. And again, I don't care who you are. You're going back in the green belt unless you start building homes. And again, try me. Ford did have a much gentler tone while addressing questions about whether he will be firing his housing minister. Uh, minister Clark has a, a tough job and and uh, his goal is to continue building homes. I, I, I saw the report. I read a good chunk of it last night. And uh, admittedly, uh, the process could have been a lot better. Now, all this after the province's integrity commissioner found Steve Clark violated two sections of the Members Integrity Act as the government removed land from the protected Greenbelt for housing. Clark did did apologize on Thursday. Yesterday's report of the integrity commissioner pointed to very clear flaws to, to the process that led to the removal of the lands being removed from the green belt. I, uh, I accept that I ought to have had greater oversight uh, over my former chief of staff and over the process. And to Ontarians, I want to say very sincerely, that I apologize that I did not. But he also stuck to his message, even as reporters did not hold back asking the minister who himself has called for other politicians to resign multiple times, including cabinet ministers, why he is not stepping down from his role after a scandal like this. Well, the buck's not stopping anywhere. Premier Clark's still here. And here, I am, I am, I am really surprised that Minister Clark still has his job. You know, the longer the Minister Clark sticks around, the more this sticks to the Premier. The longer that Minister Clark is in his job, the more the stench or the smell of this thing rubs off on the Premier. Now, only time will tell if Clark can survive the turmoil. And for more on this, very pleased to be joined by trending now host, Kelly Patello. Hi. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I made a joke, you know, the first time... Yeah, you know, I think it was the Auditor General report a few weeks ago. And I was like, okay, we can all move on now. Yeah. Thinking that, not that we were going to move on, not that that was the end of the story. Yeah. But just that people have such a short attention span. I think after the Auditor General report, Ford thought, I can get out of this. I can get in yeah. front of this. This this is, like, from somebody who's been a journalist for a while, you're in the same boat. I can't think of a scandal being held as hold being handled as poorly as this one is being by yeah. the Ford government. I mean, and, 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 you know, you said it there, like th this minister has called on uh, other people to resign. Other Several ministers. Times. Other ministers. Yes. Scandal plague. Yeah. Ministers. And so we watched, uh, of course, the two news conferences yesterday. Premier Ford had one and then Minister Clark had one. And basically they were just trying to do damage control, I guess. But really, I mean, and, and kudos to all the journalists there because they were really holding them to the fire and they stuck to their talking points like, Oh, yeah, it, you know, the way we handled the green belt process was flawed. We could have done better. I take full um, responsibility. The buck that stops Clark, with me. The buck stops with me. <laughs> it was, I, I thought, I, I will say, I thought, and good on the reporters. I, you know, I, we're small circles. We, yeah. We've crossed paths with a lot of them. It felt very combative, though. Yeah. Like, even from the reporter's standpoint, and I understand, like, when Doug Ford is going to, name drop, you know, Colin DeMello. Hey, Colin, you, you live 10 minutes away from yeah. here. So what about those people who don't have a home? Like he was getting. It was, bad. it was very, um, attacky. Like you said, from both sides, because I, 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 there was, you know, when you're trying to defend 
yourself. Yeah. And it's a reflection of Ford, too. This is his housing minister, right? It's something that he should have had more oversight over as well. So he's trying to defend himself. He's trying to defend his housing minister. And then, like you said, he goes on to kind of throw a jab at a reporter that was very <laughs> unnecessary. Like, oh, you just walked over here from your house yeah. while we're trying to build houses for other people. One like, what does 5, that have? 1.5 million homes. If I if yeah. I had a dollar, if there was a, like, if everyone had a dollar for every time he said 1.5 million homes, yeah. we'd be able to build those houses and I'd be able to afford a home. Because right. he's, like that. Like you said, talking sticking to your talking points ad nauseum no matter the question yeah we have to build 1.5 million million homes we have to build, but that's not the point yeah you could have you could have done it in a different way you can still build those homes <laughs> you can still go on it and yeah. build more houses for the people of ontario who yeah we, we do have a problem here but you don't have to uh you know have a a sketchy process or, uh, you know, not be transparent about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So they, they said this, um, this developer in Ajax, they were, they were so frustrated. I mean, the timing is so shady of mm -hmm. this announcement. Like, Oh, you just caught on with this developer right yeah. now trying to sell land that was also zoned for commercial, even though that's all supposed to be for housing. And this was their example that they want to make that if you're not following it, we're going to take it back. Mm -hmm. like if you're not following the rules that we sent, yeah. we're going to take it back from you. Yeah. And in my report, you know, I started off with um, a clip of Doug Ford saying, that's it, you're done, try me, test me, all this business. And he was talking to the developers. Like, he was yeah. angry at the people who his government sold the land to. And, you know, and okay, rightfully so, because that's that's not right what they were no, doing. No. But at the same time, it's like, well, this problem started yeah. with people in your government. Yeah. So if you're going to have that tone to the developers, you know, what are these conversations that you're having with your housing minister and what do those conversations look like? So, I mean, he's mad that what these people are trying to make money when the yeah. auditor general report says this is going to make a, not a lot of people. This is going to make those 15 developers eight billion dollars. Yeah. Like, what, rich, so rich. what's the like, what's the trade? Like, I'm sorry, because this guy threatened to sell it. A little bit earlier yeah. before there's actually something there like I, I i don't understand and how does this story go away does it is it going to take clark resigning is it gonna, i don't know you know he what? hasn't yet like if he was going to resign he should have done it two weeks ago yeah and right? i thought that maybe yesterday that 12, we 30? could have seen a resignation from him but he wasn't didn't even come close to saying that he was going to resign. No. Um, I don't know. I think that maybe if more on this story comes out and, you know, there's more uh, problems or more flaws in their their process than we even know about right now, then Which maybe. There could be. I mean, uh, but like, I think this was kind of the last investigation, the RCMP yeah. investigation last week, something or the inquiry into an investigation. Something might come out of that, but mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that Ryan Amato is not yeah. has not already been hired by a developer as a lot. Like those are the those are the the nitty gritty of the reports, both the integrity commissioner and the auditor general. That it just it just rubs me the wrong way because the lobbying industry mm -hmm. is so. I don't want to say perverse, but it's pretty damn close. Yeah. Of like, oh, you worked in the premier's office for five years and now you're a lobbyist for this company like yeah of course yeah. you have connections like lobbying in general like that's a whole different conversation mm -hmm. um but i don't know the elections far like you know john fraser goes out there and says something yeah. like I most mean, people don't know who he is you know even uh mike schreiner the one green party member like when he holds press conferences like i know who he is because i work in the business i yeah. have to know most politicians right i do think this is something that is a big deal now but by the time you know campaigning rolls around again this is going to be a th something that most people will probably have forgotten about 2026 is a long time yeah. away mm -hmm. uh you talked to mohit today yes yeah yeah talking tech trends i talked to mohit too <laughs> Uh, you. Yeah, I know. Look at me. Uh, he made an appearance on the podcast. We're going to get to that in just a second. But before we do that, yeah. Kelly, I got to ask. Labor Day weekend. What are you up to? Um, I uh, Nothing much tomorrow. Okay. That's uh, good. Yeah. And then Sunday, my sister-in-law is having a little pool party at her house, oh. which is going to be fun. So yeah. looking forward to that. How about you? 
Um, so I just tell Laura this. I'm going to Guelph nice. again. Shout out brothers. They, <laughs> they might have to sponsor the podcast now. They might. I've mentioned them twice now. <laughs> they might have to sponsor the podcast. Uh, I'll come with like a nice brew uh, next time. Uh, just my buddies have a brew pub up in uh, Guelph. I've been up there. I I usually always went up to Guelph like yeah. every weekend, uh, you know, throughout university. So it's been a while since I've been up there. So look nice. Forward. Yeah, well, that's gonna be fun. And then uh, yeah, it's my dad. It was my dad's birthday this past week. So we're doing a family stuff. So beautiful. Uh, my little my little nephew gonna be in Aww. town this weekend. Uh, uh, that I cannot wait to see, but uh, but yeah. uh, journalists don't actually have a real long weekend. So <laughs> I know, <laughs> like I, many other people, I do. But know. You actually do. You're off Monday. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I mean, it took some creative scheduling. <laughs> like they asked me to work a different shift. Oh, okay. I, like, can I, I see. Can I? Can I? Can I have Monday? Oh, off? you swung that. So eh? I'm, I know. So I'm going to the Labor Day Classic. Beauty. Yeah, for the first time as a fan. In a very long time. So that should be fun. 3.30 kickoff. Tim Hortons Field should be a lot of fun. Nice weather. Beautiful. Like 31. Like I'm going to get like burnt. I'm going to be red. I'm going to be red face, <laughs> like tomato face coming in on Tuesday. I can't wait. Home. Yeah. All right. Uh, Kelly, thanks for doing this. Appreciate Thank you. It. All right. As mentioned, Kelly uh, spoke with Mohit Rajahans. That's did I, Mo, Mohit. Kelly's looking at me. Mohit. <laughs> I got it right. Mohit Rogins. Mohit Rogins. That's what I said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, basically. Kai. Uh, <laughs> thanks for sticking around to help me with that one. Uh, but I also spoke with uh, Mohit uh, after Kelly did. And uh, here's just a, a little bit of our conversation from earlier today. Back to school, obviously a very uh, interesting ki- time when it comes to, uh, to tech. So what's some of the news you're following as we head into the new school year? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many different technology companies are really going after the education market, considering they all have come out with later latest innovations that they're hoping really goes after Gen Alpha and Gen Z. And most of that is embedded in the talk around artificial intelligence. But a lot of what I'm tracking as well is the social media shift. So basically, we're in a point right now where people are coming to terms with what they're really using social media for. And I'm, I get all these questions often from parents right down to people in business where they talk about the simple things that they just can't navigate. And what's happening is we've gone from a place where everybody feels like they need to be on every social media platform to really finding the value in creating community on one or two places based on your needs. And that's the part that I'm really loving to explore right now. The fact that, you know, five generations on the internet, how are you all navigating for what you actually need in your life? How are parents keeping an eye on what their kids are doing online, especially going back to school. How has that been developing and where are we at when it comes to those conversations that parents should be having with their children when it comes to these social media apps? Truth be told, the status of digital literacy in this country is horrible. Mm. We are not in a situation where any one entity is being held accountable. Many parents struggle to keep up the same way that we struggled to keep up with any pop culture reference growing up in this country. The truth is kids end up using a lot of these apps in some cases for just one thing or for a week sometimes. Where we have to go back to is understand that the, the phone is no longer a toy, it's a tool. And if our kids don't understand those apps as being a part of that tool, then they're not in a situation yet where they should be using any of the apps. Most social media apps are actually age restricted. What I would encourage parents is to at first introduce them to that concept, that there is an age restriction associated with their use and furthering some of the issues associated with not abiding by those rules could be problematic. Uh, Let's get back to some of the uh, back to school trends. What are you looking at heading into uh, the new school year when it comes to technology trends? I think we're going to go full in and trying to understand more about how artificial intelligence is going to change the way people are actually learning. I think some teachers will really dive into how to use these tools inside of classrooms and make, uh, of course, technology a little bit more immersive and education more immersive in that process. On the other side, I think we're going to start to see more restrictions on how social media can be used within classrooms as well. Uh, Twitter is a great example, going through their rebranding as X, a real vital way for educators to use new sources has been Twitter in the past. There's going to be a reimagining of relying on social media. And then let's not forget, you know, there's an aspect of Canadian news that's missing right now when it comes down to social media. And how are you going to reteach people about how research works inside of the classroom? All of these things are things that I'm following. 
Uh, you got a new book that you're working on? I do, I do. I have a new book, an ebook out called Navigating the Social Media Shift. And it's really designed furthering these conversations for parents and professionals. Awesome. Mohit, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, extending our conversation a little bit further uh, that you had uh, with, uh, with us earlier. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. That was Mohit Rajans. My thanks to him for joining me as part of the show. My thanks to Kelly Patello. My thanks to Laura Seven. My thanks to Jason Guy. Dola as well. My thanks to everybody in the control room who helped put the show together uh, and uh, the editors, you know, everybody who really gets the show off the ground because uh, Fridays I come in and I'm like, I'm doing a podcast. Uh, and then somehow by the end of the day, there's a podcast. So I uh, appreciate everybody's hard work in uh, in making this show what it is. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Uh, I'm Louis Butko from all of us here at CHCH. Hoping you have a great long weekend. Thank you.